Tonight, preparing to go into Gaza, trucks filled with aid are ready to cross as Israel says its soldiers will soon be on the ground. The message to Israeli forces. The fear and frustration for Canadians still trapped in Gaza. Please help us. I'm very scared. There are bombs everywhere. And the fiancé of a Canadian hero shares his sacrifice. He saved me until the last minute. He protect me. Rallying in anger on a global scale. <laughs> Signs of polarization over free speech on Canadian campuses. So universities should be the places that ask the hard questions. Plus, unwrapping a green predicament. The cost to families would increase to a pretty significant point. What getting rid of plastic could mean for prices. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. New signs tonight. Israel's ground offensive into Gaza may be imminent. The country's defense minister telling troops they will soon see Gaza from the inside, as Israel got a boost from a fresh shipment of armored vehicles sent by the United States. While in Gaza, the humanitarian crisis deepens, and basics like running water and food dwindle. The volley of violence continued today, Israel bombing Gaza and Hamas rockets flying over Israel. Late tonight, the U.S. president, back in Washington after a brief visit to Tel Aviv, addressed his nation, making the pitch for why the U.S. should support two simultaneous wars. To support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine, is a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. CTV's Heather Wright starts us off. The shelves at local markets in Gaza are nearly bare as food, water and medical supplies run dangerously low. If we continue living in these circumstances, Gaza will transform into a mass grave, this merchant says. The Rafah crossing between Egypt and Gaza may open as early as Friday, allowing roughly 20 trucks, including five carrying medical supplies, to start rolling in. We need those security guarantees so the supplies can be delivered uh, where they're needed most. The United Nations estimates there are now one million internally displaced people in Gaza. Many told to flee the north or the south where it would be safe. But explosions there today sent people running. It has been nearly two weeks since Hamas gunmen stormed into southern Israel, killing more than 1,400 people, including Canadian-Israeli Netta Epstein, who jumped on a grenade to save his fiance, Irene Shavit. We start hearing uh, gunshots. Irene and Netta were hiding in the safe room of their home in Kibbutz Kfar Aza when gunmen broke in, forced the safe room door open, and began throwing grenades. They uh, throw the third grenade. It, it uh, was rolling through me. And Neta jumped. It. Uh, they, he jumped, and during the jump, they shoot him. Aren lay behind Neta, his body hiding her. I saw him dying. I saw him bleeding to death, and just lying there. <laughs> and he saved me until the last minute. They protect me. Because of him, they didn't see me. Ren says Netta was always looking for fun and always looking out for others. The two were starting to build their lives together. I love him still. I can't speak at him in the past. He's still with me. So many innocent lives lost in this conflict, so many more still suffering. When that aid does arrive in Gaza, it will be distributed by Egypt, the United Nations and the Palestinian Red Crescent. This is to ensure it gets into the hands of civilians, not militants. Omar. CTV's Heather Wright in Tel Aviv tonight. Thank you. 
And you can hear more about Netta Epstein's final moments and hear from his family in Canada on W5 next Friday. The Prime Minister would not comment today on Israel's claims backed by the U.S. The deadly blast that struck a Gaza hospital earlier this week came from Palestinian militants. We are taking the necessary time to look carefully at everything and rapidly, of course, before we draw any final conclusions about what happened. Hundreds were killed when the hospital was hit on Tuesday. The federal government has helped people leaving Israel and says it's planning to do the same in Gaza. But so far, Canadians trapped there can only wait. CTV's Joe Makashan checked back with one family today. In Gaza, as the death toll continues to rise, so too does concern for Canadians trapped inside. I am very scared uh, when I never can sleep at night. There are bombs everywhere. This is one of the latest videos sent home to a worried father. 11-year-old Shanaz, her 15-year-old brother Wasim, and their mother Nisreen Abu Arda have been trying to leave Gaza for nearly two weeks now. They're just hearing bomb everywhere all the time. A family feeling double the fear and frustration. His brother Mohammed's wife and three children are also in Gaza. Seven members of one family all waiting for one path home. I know it's Canada, it's a strong country and the Canadian government, they can take action. They got the people from Israel from West Bank and how about the Canadians in Gaza Strip? The danger in Gaza laid out again today for the world to see, as the near constant bombings continued in central parts of the territory. That horrific explosion at one of Gaza's main hospitals has left other medical facilities scrambling to take in patients. Here in Nasser Hospital, doctors are working on the injured by the light of cell phones. More children, more women will die and face the death without any medical help. The U.S. State Department said it will try and get American citizens out of Gaza as humanitarian aid moves in. Canadian officials have been saying for more than a week now, Canada is working to secure safe passage for its citizens. We need to make sure that Canadians get out of Gaza. There's around 400 Canadians. For this Canadian girl, the days are becoming desperate. I want to go back to my home country. I dream to see my friends and my family. The Abu Arda brothers tell me they are hitting walls when it comes to contacting the government about their families. Phone calls are put on hold for hours and then disconnected. Emails contain no new information. And again tonight, Omar, no answers. All right, Jill, thank you. The Pentagon says a U.S. warship in the northern Red Sea intercepted three missiles and several drones fired from Yemen today. It believes they were heading towards targets in Israel. This action was a demonstration of the integrated air and missile defense architecture that we have built in the Middle East and that we are prepared to utilize whenever necessary to protect our partners and our interests in this important region. Officials say the USS Kearney, a Navy destroyer, shot down the land attack cruise missiles fired by Iranian-backed Houthi forces in Yemen. U.S. President Joe Biden delivered only the second Oval Office address of his time in office tonight and made a case for backing Israel and Ukraine. Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy. And joining us now from Washington is political analyst Eric Ham. Eric, Joe Biden called it an inflection point in history tonight. Walk us through the strategy of linking Ukraine and Israel. Well, given what we're seeing play out right now, the president had to make the sale. He had to build the bridge for the American people to explain why it's important and why it's crucial for the United States to be engaged, at least monetarily, and more importantly, why helping Israel and, of course, Ukraine actually bolsters America's priorities, particularly around national security. Now, the president also said he would send an urgent funding request to Congress. What do we know about the details? Well, the big headline is going to be the $40 billion of this package. It's a $100 billion package, $40 billion going to Israel, $60 billion going to Ukraine. But within that $40 billion, what's going to move some of those perhaps more difficult Republicans who have been very hard 
core about not providing funding for Ukraine. In that $40 billion is going to be money for the southern border. So people like Jim Jordan, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, those are some of the Republicans that might move this package along, given that it's going to have funding for the southern border. All right, Eric, thank you. One day after Joe Biden was in Israel, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also visited Tel Aviv in a show of solidarity. In the last two weeks, this country has gone through something that no country, no people, should have to endure. Following talks with Benjamin Netanyahu, Sunak traveled to Saudi Arabia, where he met with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, encouraging him to use his influence to stop the war from spreading and support stability in the Middle East. Outside the region, this conflict has led to a rise in international protests and hate on both sides. CTV's Heather Butts on concerns about the increasing anger. Massive crowds protesting in Algeria, lining the streets of France and gathering in Pakistan. The deadly blast at a hospital in Gaza sparked outrage and is fueling the size and scale of rallies. Instead of a two-state solution, we are now going towards a one-state solution, and that one state is only Israel. Where is Palestine? Should the Palestinians jump into the sea? From the river to the sea! Thirteen days since the conflict began, pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel rallies around the world, bringing a new generation to the streets. People who see the region as a key marker of their identity, purpose and historical experiences, says this expert. Many people look to this conflict and see themselves, see their parents, see their own communities, you know, caught up in this particular conflict in ways that, you know, resonate deeply. But the developments in the Middle East are also leading to increased anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. You know, we're seeing rising tides of hate, and this is a direct result of a conflict of this nature, you know, simmering to a boiling point. In Chicago, just days ago, a six-year-old Muslim boy was stabbed to death, police say, by the family's landlord. In Toronto, police say the rate of reported hate crimes has nearly tripled since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Hate isn't just a problem for the Jewish community in Toronto. It's a problem for our entire city. It is corrosive to the values we hold dear. Protests are likely to grow louder as this conflict rages on amid growing fears of it becoming a regional war. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. Canada accused India today of acting contrary to international law as Ottawa pulled dozens of diplomats from New Delhi. CTV's Judy Trin on the deepening tensions. In just hours, India was set to strip diplomatic immunity from 41 Canadian diplomats, leaving the federal government no choice but to pull them out. Given the implications of India's actions on the safety of our diplomats, we have facilitated their safe departure from India. This means that our diplomats and their families have now left. That means Canada's official presence shrinks to just 21 diplomats, one third of what it was. The expulsions, the result of this. Any involvement of a foreign government in the killing of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is an unacceptable violation of our sovereignty. One month ago, the Prime Minister accused India of being involved in the murder of Hardeep Singh Najjar. We always want a diplomatic solution to these things. Again, I'm not the diplomat, but um, we, want, we won't compromise our principles at the same time. The diplomatic fallout will now impact the processing of thousands of immigration applications from India. Student visas, work permits to family sponsorships will be delayed by months. This is a serious rupture in, in that relationship uh, and it cannot, it's cannot be made up by other means, quite frankly. You need a lot of people on the ground for many of those services. Also at risk. Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, the country's economic plan for the next half century. Expanding trade with India was key. Business loves uh, predictability and stability. We had a clear roadmap of where we were going. There was a potential trade agreement uh, that was in place and uh, all those things have changed. Improving relationships with India was central to the strategy of counterbalancing concerns of China's political interference. Now there are growing fears that Canada has isolated itself from two of the world's biggest economies. Omar. All right, Judy, thank you. Coming up. We should be able to give our students the tools to be citizens that have an ability to critically think about global issues. 
examining free speech on Canadian university campuses, plus helping the homeless land on their feet. University campuses on both sides of the border have become flashpoints of the crisis playing out in the Middle East. Students have organized protests and vigils, most of them peaceful. But there have also been clashes, and some students say they are being targeted both by university administrators and other groups for taking sides. CTV's Montreal Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin reports. Uh, excuse me, why are you taking that off? This clash at McGill University was over a poster. My a student confronted a campus security guard who was taking down a sign put up in support of Israeli hostages kidnapped by Hamas. McGill says it's standard procedure to remove unauthorized posters. But the face-off and this one during a protest at Carleton University last week point to escalating tensions at university campuses. Those are grounds long regarded as places of societal debate. But some who speak out now say they face backlash. And both Jewish and Muslim groups report intimidation, harassment. There's been an exponential increase in the number of cases that we are dealing with. At universities in the U.S., divisions have proven particularly polarizing. For instance, at Harvard, a billboard truck displayed pictures of students alleged to have signed a letter holding the Israeli regime entirely responsible for the crisis. The history of protests on campuses is a long and storied one. This was in 1969 at Sir George Williams in Montreal, a student occupation against racism. We have to step into big questions. We have to uh, thoughtfully analyze global conflicts. And so when it comes to our students, we need to be supporting that with them. But soon say some university leaders and other groups are working to silence their voices to kick opinions on the crisis off the campus. And here just outside McGill Gates, there's this poster calling for a demonstration tomorrow afternoon against student repression. Universities face what is at times a difficult task, ensuring the safety of students while allowing and encouraging debate and free speech. We should be able to give our students the tools to be citizens that have an ability to critically think about global issues. Empowering engaged students, she says, to be agents of peace. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Lawyer Sidney Powell pleaded guilty to reduce charges over efforts to overturn Donald Trump's loss in the 2020 election in Georgia. Powell was charged alongside Trump and 17 others with violating Georgia's anti-racketeering law. She's the second defendant in the case to reach a deal with prosecutors. Okay. Powell will serve six years of probation, be fined $6,000, and will have to write an apology letter to the residents of Georgia. Still ahead, the problem with plastic. How using less could cost you more. Two months from now, buying plastic checkout bags or cutlery won't be an option for Canadian shoppers. Part of the government's push to put a wrap on plastic, one of the main sources of toxic waste in Canadian landfills. CTV's Kevin Gallagher on how another part of that plan has created pitfalls. At the grocery store, fresh fruits and vegetables packaged in plastic are everywhere. We hear it from Canadians from coast to coast to coast that they, they, they hate seeing so much plastic wrapping. So we ask gro grocery chains, come back to us and, and let's work together on, on solutions to, to reduce this. To curb the amount, the federal government is proposing new rules. For at least 75% of fresh produce to be in plastic-free packaging by 2026 and at least 95% by 2028. It's an ambitious timeline that Canadian fruit and vegetable producers say is not realistic. We could do it, but the cost to families would increase our produce prices to a pretty significant point. The Canadian Produce Marketing Association warns consumers will pay at least 30% more for fresh fruits and vegetables if the proposed targets are implemented, as the industry says current plastic alternatives are more expensive and have higher rates of food spoilage. Plastic, because it's not extremely permeable, it stops any mold and decay from spreading quite rapidly. 
Plastic bags at the checkout have already been banned. Environmentalists say plastic packaging amounts for more than half of the 4.4 million tons of plastic waste thrown out each year. Most of it ends up in landfills. We are over wrapping products. We have to stop. And a great place to start is fruit and vegetables. Despite disagreements on how to do it, all parties involved agree plastic waste needs to be reduced. But the produce industry warns the government's current approach to fix one problem could create another. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News, Ottawa. After the break, a common hobby meeting a critical need. A Nova Scotia woman's passion will be warming the souls of hundreds this winter. She's behind a growing campaign to meet a growing need in her community. And as CTV's Chris and Ajkate reports, it all started with a little bit of yarn and a lot of love. So this is where we store all the socks. For the last three years, Mary Crosby has been collecting thousands of pairs of socks to give to those in need. If you're homeless and you're out walking the streets, what are you going to wear out first, is your socks. It started with a small knitting group. That's grown into a community campaign with hundreds of participants on her Facebook page, Socks for Shelters. This year, she's on track to collect 7,000 pairs. They're my go-to. If I'm sitting, I'm knitting. And it's usually socks. She's knitted so many pairs, she's earned a couple of new nicknames. Well, the big one is Mary Queen of Socks. I was labeled that last year. Crosby says she relied on a shelter 25 years ago. Their supplies that they had to offer then were always limited. She admits she can't do this alone and can't believe the outpouring of support and generosity. Literally overwhelming. When it started, I couldn't even pick up a donation without crying. I just didn't, you know, I didn't expect this to go the way it did. Socks are the number one need in shelters including here at Souls Harbour Rescue Mission in Halifax. I would say we go through hundreds in a week and that would add up to thousands in a month. There are now more than 1,000 people who are homeless in the city and staff say Crosby's big donation is always needed. I think last year she donated over 3,000 pairs of socks to us, so that's incredible. Crosby is now preparing to send her next big donation in December, excited to help where she can of thanks that we received and few things mean as much as the kindness given by others. Thank you so much. Makes it all worthwhile. Chris Najkate, CTV News, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. A worthy cause and clearly a small act making a big difference. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather Butts will be here tomorrow. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching and good night. National News, Canada's number one newscast.